Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture for English Language Units 3 and 4. My name is Sunny, I'm really excited to be delivering this presentation today and I hope that you find this to be a really useful head start for the subject this year. Let's jump right into it. So we'll first begin with a little bit of information about myself. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Sunny. I completed VC in 2021 and I was college ducks with an ATAR of 96.70. Uh, my highest study score was a 47 in legal studies and I received study scores of 40 plus. Um, I did complete all three English subjects, so English, literature, and English language. And I'm currently completing a Bachelor of Paramedicine course at Monash University, and I'm in the last year of my degree. Um, and that's all the information about myself that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, so I'll just begin with how today is basically going to run. Um, the big two sections that our, uh, our lecture is split into today, so the first section will be sort of like an overview of the subject and most of the key things that you'll need to know and things that you'll be using throughout the year. And that will include the big ideas, which you should be familiar from year 11 and lots and lots of meta language. We'll sort of be going through each and every one of the subsystems and what you need to know for all of them. Um, the reason uh, this is basically just giving you a good basis for the whole year, all of these concepts that we look at will be accessible. Um, you will not only um, be potentially asked to answer questions um, and apply them, but also for your analytical commentary. Okay, uh, and then the second half of the session we look at, and this is directly unit free, um, formal and informal language, an introduction into register of some sort. Um, and we will look from all of those meta language concepts that we covered um, and every concept falling under each subsystem. How can you find features that prove a text has a formal register or an informal register or hopefully both because it's better if you write about both um so hopefully we'll all come together and make sense i do want to say it is a lengthy session i recommend not wasting time trying to scramble to write notes instead just try to pay attention as much as possible to the session from the same page that you are on, the recording of the lecture will be available for another week. So you can access it from the same page and you can download the slides um, from the resources tab on the same page that you're on. We also have a live chat Q&A. So during the session, um, ask me any questions you have about the subject or if something's unclear about that content that we're going through because we do have to go through it quite quickly. A lot of these things are concepts that you'll have to go research, look for examples, learn about in more detail in your own time just due to the pace of the lesson okay and i will be um present throughout the broadcast in the live chat and i will be answering you guys's questions throughout we'll then lastly finish up with <clears throat> the analytical commentary um which is a sort of like a type of essay that if you haven't done you'll be doing it a lot this year as well as on the exam and we'll look at some frequently asked questions in this subject and tips Beautiful. All right, so we'll begin with an overview of English language. In this subject overall, uh, we're looking at how people use language and how and why people change their language. Pretty good definition of the subject. So your unit three will be looking at formal and informal language. A lot of um, this is really covered today. Um, and Unit 4 looks at how that language varies in Australian society. So we need to use meta language, and this is an expectation of the subject. It is quite difficult in English language because there is so many terms you need to remember and apply. 
and you never know what is going to come up and what you will need to use okay you can never expect it uh, my biggest tip is just to really pay attention to these terms make sure they're clear to you have an example of each term or a few examples annotate text to try to apply your knowledge and test yourself and never leave anything unnamed if you're answering a short answer question if you're writing an analytical commentary and you're quoting from a text and you just refer to your evidence without naming it and using the appropriate meta language to name what it actually is um, your marks in this subject will suffer don't be um hesitant and afraid though because you do obviously have the whole year to get the hang of this this is not something you can get the hang of in the last one month in the lead up of exams if you just relax all year and you don't really pay attention it's not one of those things that's gonna become clear it needs time so try to start give, setting up like a really good basis for for yourself really early on starting now okay um so our first big idea and one we'll look at in a bit more detail later on is register and register is the degree of formality in a text usually when you read something you just get a sense of how formal or informal it is why do i say how formal or informal because it's on a spectrum <clears throat> so never say that a text is completely formal or a text is completely informal you need to use less definitive terms when you 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 are defining the register of a text you can say things like the text is predominantly formal the text is predominantly informal and the secret to as well being a good student is to exp uh, explore if there if if we are working with a mostly formal text a good student in english language will go and find some informal features and they will identify the register as being you know predominantly formal with some informal features and then they will actually find those informal features and analyze them on top of the formal features so this is why you need to understand that it's a spectrum and try to look at it from both sides try to find both features there will be some text especially formal text that really will be just very very formal but most texts and especially exam texts you can find both uh degrees of formality and informality to so try to use that to your advantage okay this is what you should remember from year 11 but our uh our first of the big uh, second of the big ideas that we're looking at is situational context quite self-explanatory you need to know what falls under situational context and be able to identify these things for every text that you're working with so first of all mode if this is just basically whether the text is written or spoken you mention this in one word when you're writing an analytical commentary essentially these situational context elements are usually what comprises the introduction of an analytical commentary response that we're going to be looking at later for now i just want you to understand them and be able to identify them within a text so first is the text written or spoken setting where is the text set if it's a written text where did uh the text um appear okay where was it published if it's a spoken text say a speech where is the speech being delivered all right now the field is the overall topic of the text what is the text about okay what does it discuss expect that there can be more than one field and it is best to identify the major field the biggest sort of part of that text and some smaller fields and be able to state them as well the function of the text we're about to look at in a second function is essentially what it's aiming to achieve and what it's aiming to do um, and the relationship between interlocutors so the people or persons engaging in a, a piece of discourse a conversation whatever it may be what is their relationship additionally you look for things like whether there is a power imbalance whether one of the individuals has 
higher status um, than the other, whether that would change that conversation as a result of that. Um, if it's a writer, it's their relationships with the readers that they're targeting. So this is essentially what you look for. So be able to break this down for every text. <clears throat> <clears throat> when we look at function, we look at what the participants are using the text to do, or more accurately, what they are trying to achieve. And I want to say that this is quite a comprehensive list for most texts in terms of function, but I want you to know that it's basically any verb that you make up, okay? So this is just to help you as a guide, but if you read a text and the function is something something more suitable is whatever you've come up with, if that that's more specific, you should be using that instead, okay? What if the text was um, <clears throat> trying to humor more than entertain? Would you still put down entertain? You could, but you could be even more specific. Probably not even the best example. But this is not the function of all texts, okay? This isn't an insufficient list for that. So just know that it's not just the textbook terms. It's good to know these textbook terms, but you should be able to adapt and add more there if it was if you thought it was suitable to do. So I've put the, a list, a small list of some text types that are kind of um, <clears throat> commonly achieving certain types of functions as a bit of a guide. So informing, of course, you could imagine a lecture aims to inform, a newspaper aims to inform, promising things, trying to persuade people to hold a certain opinion, commemorating something. So someone's, someone's retiring, so people are commemorating this person for all their hard work. Uh, a toast at uh, an anniversary or a birthday party of some sort is commemorating that person. All right. Um, and I do think the other words are quite self-explanatory. Now, looking at social purpose, not to be uh, confused, all of these terms are separate, but you should be all across all of them. Okay, so just while we're talking about all of these, I want to say that these are all ideas that you would write about in an analytical commentary, which is going to be on your exam later on. So just remember that they're important. The social purpose is what the participants are using the text to do socially, the social influence that they're trying to create, okay? So um, an author might be trying to establish expertise by informing a lot in their text, using fancy words, elevated meta-language, they might be trying to establish expertise as someone in a certain position or in a certain line of work. Um, someone may be trying to manipulate, say a politician may be trying to manipulate people to uh, vote, uh, vote for them by promising certain things they're not going to do. Um, clarifying, making a concept clear, obfuscating means lying, essentially hiding the truth. Um, so let's say something controversial has happened. Um, uh, a person may be coming out that is responsible or partly responsible for that situation. And they may be trying to obfuscate or hide the truth. They may be using lots of different words to talk around the issue um, in indirect uh, explanations that don't really make anything start to make sense. In, in a way. So maybe that's familiar to a lot of like apology videos, for, for instance. Um, someone may be trying to build rapport, especially if there's two people in conversation and it's in a casual informal setting. They may be just trying to build rapport with one another, a sense of, of closure, friendship, right? Negotiating taboos, reinforcing authority, maintaining challenging face and encouraging intimacy. I'm thinking if I should ex explain any of these. So someone might be trying to talk about those taboo controversial topics in society to try to remove some of that associated taboo. 
someone might be trying to reinforce their position a bit different than establishing expertise oh i'm an expert in something this is more like oh i have all of this power you can't take it away from me i have i'm in this position where i can do all of these things okay uh face needs haven't really looked at yet i don't think maybe you did in year 11. um maintaining face needs versus challenging face needs are opposites when we maintain face needs um positive or negative uh essentially we prevent offending when we challenge we do offend in in a nutshell positive face needs um are more to do with making someone feel included like they're part of something like they're accepted so if they're being maintained that person or people will feel like they're part of something and negative face needs are to do with independence making people feel as though if they're being maintained not challenged making them feel as though they have free will to make their own decisions and they are independent and no one's going to take that right away okay so if these are being challenged instead a person will feel like they're being forced to do something or forced to choose or someone's telling them what to do okay um and encouraging um intimacy is a last one on the list similarly to what we said about function you can create your own social purposes if you deem this to be more appropriate for a specific text that you're working with looking at cultural context this is all about what attitudes values and beliefs influence the text they're essentially cultural factors okay so we see a huge list here um, I see a lot of students just forget about the cultural context completely. Don't forget that this is something you can talk about and something you can use and you can create quite an interesting discussion um, if you discuss cultural context. So I don't encourage you to disregard it. Um, always remember that it's there. In terms of meta language tips that I have for you guys, I've kind of said some of this, but you do kind of need definitions for everything, but I recommend understanding concepts rather than ever memorizing them. That way you won't forget them and you can create your own definitions for things. And that will leave a lot more room in your head for other stuff and stuff. It actually makes sense to uh, rote learn and you, you need to rote learn. Okay. You need examples for everything because you'll never really need to apply definitions uh, by just writing them down, but you need to apply definitions by um, the meta finding the actual meta language term in a text you haven't seen before, meaning you need to understand all of these concepts, okay? Um, so just have examples for everything. In fact, I kind of used to just memorize an example for everything rather than a definition. Of course, the concept had to make sense to me first before I memorized the example. And then I would be able to um, understand more and more, remember more and more meta language terms by annotating texts and looking to break them down just as much as possible into different pieces of meta language, analyze it, what does it mean? How does it contribute to um, that text construction and meaning? Um, <clears throat> understand the purposes of meta language. So basically every concept in English language has some sort of general purpose. Every little technique has a general function that it serves. So learn or be aware of, be able to say what the general purpose or effect of each technique is, but then when you're actually working with a short answer question or analyzing in an analytical commentary in an AC, you actually need to take that general purpose and make it specific, okay, to your specific text. Um, so that's a skill that develops over time by writing a lot, but you do need to know general purposes in order to make accurate analytical ideas with a specific text. Um, English language is all about being specific. Be aware of umbrella terms. Be aware of those big terms that lots of things come under. Don't be the student that doesn't know the difference between sentence structure and sentence types and lose, uh, loses a whole heap of marks for, for that, okay? 
um, or the, the student that even worse just hears the word, word uh, sentence structure and nothing comes to mind. Um, if you can create some something like abbreviations or something to help you remember, do so. Um, I find that you can still remember things in the subject without doing that. Probably makes more sense to just have a level of understanding and some examples. You never know what's going to come up, uh, especially in the case of short answer questions. Can be absolutely anything. Analytical commentaries. Uh, every single time, every AC, there's di different things, okay, present in that text. Just looking at an example of a short answer question, identify two different modal verbs and explain the function of each one is given context. So, for example, not knowing what a modal verb is in this situation would make the question impossible to answer. And you would need to know the general purpose of a modal verb in order to be able to extrapolate it with the given text to try to explain the function. All right, so that's it for that sort of big ideas introduction. Now we're going to go subsystem by subsystem, just going to cruise through the subsystems of the English language, and we'll start with phonetics and phonology. So hopefully you remember that phonetics and phonology, that's all about the study of, of sounds, okay? And as part of that, we look at prosody and prosodic features. So this is one of those umbrella terms. So what falls under this and uh, you need to be able to um, work with is pitch. So whether your voice has a high or low pitch, uh, stress, emphasis placed on words. When we stress words, we emphasize something. Um, volume, whether it's loud or quiet, obviously that's going to change throughout um, the text, the spoken text. Tempo, fast or slow, uh, and intonation is the pitch pattern the changes from high to low pitch. So you don't really see pitch annotated in a text, but you see the intonation changes annotated in the text. And this is what I mean by that, okay? Um, this You need to be familiar with, uh, with these, and you need to be able to read a text, and as you read, know, understand the prosodic features that uh, you're seeing and be able to analyze them, okay? So, this is loud speech. This is uh, this signifies a pause. A short pause would just be more dots, okay? Um, emphatic stress and underline underneath the word shows that that syllable or entire uh, word is being stressed. L for slow speech, like uh, um, in comparison to the F for loud speech. Um, and rising intonation. If the squiggle is facing the opposite way, it's falling intonation. So we can see if you literally follow the line, this is rising. And if it points in the opposite direction, it's falling. Okay. So we can see here an example question. Discuss the functions of at least two different prosodic features in the section of the speech. So prosodic features is all of this that has been marked. This means that we can choose anything we want to analyze. One that students really like to do that's always so easy to analyze is just stress. But remember, that's only one prosodic feature. So we could uh, go and analyze why fairness, commitment has been stressed. So if we have a look at an example, Turnbull places stress on words such as yes and the abstract noun fairness. Note the meta language here because there's not much we can say except the word class we've gone and named fairness uh, said that it was an abstract noun to overcome the issue and ensure that there is still some meta language in our response and our little mini analysis here is that it's highlighting the importance of these terms because that's what stress does similarly the manipulation of tempo from the slow utterance yes to love here um, emphasizes the significance of the statement. So we've intentionally slowed down there. Um, some additional features we could analyze that there's the rising intonation at the ends of fairness, equality, commitment, um, signals that the listing is not complete, that there's basically many, many more things uh, 
that fall under marriage equality, many happy things and good qualities and that he's just naming a few. So it signifies that that thought isn't finished to make it more impactful. And there's loud speech also used for emphasis and to hold the floor. This is where Turnbull reinforces his authority. It's time for us to get on with it in a really loud voice. Pay attention to me. Okay. So it holds the floor, gives him the turn to speak. Beautiful. So you'll see this a lot throughout this year. Um, get into the hang of, of working with these spoken texts and analyzing them. Next, having a look at phonological patterning. So a few terms we need to know here. Thankfully, falling under this umbrella term, rhythm and rhyme, whether words rhyme and what rhythm um, is very self-explanatory. So I haven't included a definition for you guys, but we'll look at the others. Alliteration is when two words or a group of words start with the same sound. So Bruce Banner, we see they're both starting with um, that B sound. Okay. Now, assonance and consonance are the sort of, you can think of them as opposites. Okay. Because assonance is the resemblance of vowel sounds. So <clears throat> it doesn't mean that the vowels are the same. Uh, it just means that it creates uh, a similar sound. Okay. And that's created by vowels. So early bird is an example. Now, doesn't have to be in the same part. It doesn't have to be at the start of the word, like alliteration, okay? It, it, it's not like it has to be at the start of every word. It can be in the middle of words, etc., etc. Um, Look up some more examples of these as well, I recommend, just to make it clear. But assonances are resemblance or vowel sounds across it, two or a few different words. <clears throat> now, consonance is the resemblance of consonant sounds, not vowels. So come home, the M sound, the M creates a similar sound, doesn't it? The O-M in the middle to be specific. And that's created by the consonant, the consonant M. Okay. Onomatopoeia is uh, anything that tries to imitate an actual sound that exists. So TikTok is uh, how we imitate um, a clock sound. Time's running out. So that's an, a, a, an example of that as well. Beautiful. When we look at the study of sound, we also inevitably look at accent. And we look at the Australian accent as part of um, English language. So the Australian accent is split into cultivated, general, and broad. The cultivated accent is how the fancy people speak that's the assumption the stereotype that it's associated with basically this is the posh accent that is associated sounds like british let's say like clean british speech that's the easiest way for me to describe it the associations are stereotypically with the cultivated accent is a high level of education high level of income potentially having english descent um the general accent is what most people use in Australia, um, just the casual way that most Australians speak. Okay, um, So this is considered typical. And that's, again, associated with those stereotypes of normal level of education, normal level of in income, and it is the most widespread across Australia. Um, I've included pictures, hopefully, that helps to create some associations as well. Now, a broad accent is what stereotypically uh, is called, uh, what people call bogan, okay? And that's um, usually associated with a lower socioeconomic status, living regionally or rurally, working more farm or trade-based jobs rather than um, an educated profession, a profession where an education is needed, um, less commonly spoken across Australia than the general accent okay so you'll kind of learn about the accents and have to create these associations with stereotypes okay um because english language does admit this as well the reality is that we judge people based on their accent and we assume certain characteristics about them 
you're not talking about a single person here you're talking about a group of people um it is stereotypes but um it's what uh the subject wants us to do so all about those value judgments some linguist quotes that sort of agree with the same idea accent is a fundamental marker of identity and not just one type of identity not just your personal identity but um lots of various factors about yourself and your life social factors as well cultural factors um we prize egalitarianism in australia but still at some level we judge and categorize it's a struggle not to and as we judge and categorize we often miss what's being said because we hear how it's being said so this Eliot's uh quote um shows that accents can lead to lots of prejudice. Beautiful. Now, with regards to phonetics and phonology, there is also a certain level of expectation in this subject that you will be familiar with the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, mainly not how the sounds are made, like we can see with the pictures, but with the symbols for sounds. Um, if you studied another language before that uses the IPA to um, draw the pronunciation of certain words, you'll find this really, really easy. I thankfully had that advantage. Otherwise, jump on some websites. I've linked one here that gives you the IPA and it's interactive um, and start learning it. You don't need to know all of them, but essentially the idea is if you choose to write about phonetics and phonology in an analytical commentary, you actually should be uh, aware of some of the symbols to be able to draw them in your essay to illustrate what sound is being created that you're analyzing, okay? Um, so you actually need the symbols. Maybe uh, you're drawing a syllable to illustrate how something sounds that you're trying to analyze. Beautiful. So that's all that we're going to look at for phonetics and phonology. Now moving into morphology and lexicology. So lexicology, as we know, is our study of words and morphology is the study of morphemes. They're the smaller parts that make up a word. Obviously, word classes apply to lexicology. <clears throat> You're expected to know word classes as part of the subject. Um, so re I recommend creating those short, really easy definitions for everything that you're not super familiar with. We know a noun is a thing, a verb is an action, auxiliary verbs are basically helping verbs that go along with the verb, next to the verb. Modal verbs are, are, can, must, should, may, and they can be high modality and low modality. So we could have things like could, can't it can be more or less definitive low modality means it sounds less definitive so must is a high modality verb and uh may is a low modality verb for example so they're also split into high and low modality um an adjective is a word that's used to describe a noun often goes before a noun an adverb describes something else prepositions show relations uh maybe you can use an example of yourself in relation to a box under on top of it over it where are you located in space but they're also to do with uh time place etc so it's relations between different objects a pronoun is a substitute for a noun everyone knows what a pronoun is in 2024 so that's easy conjunctions join things together they're the parts the little words that help to join a sentence so it sticks um determiners precede a noun phrase um and interjections occur by themselves beautiful so I recommend just find an example for especially the smaller ones that you think you still might confuse. Um, and we'll look at affixation next. Now we're looking at morphemes, okay? So we know the word affix just means to attach something to something else. And I've included that little definition there to make it a bit easier to grasp what affixation is. 
So affixation is literally sticking together the morphemes and stems to make words. The morpheme is the smallest possible unit of me me meaning. It's basically just all the tiny parts that are needed to make up words. Okay? It's not a syllable. It can be, um, but it's the little parts that are used to make up words. And the stem is uh, the part of the word that if it stood by itself, it would still make sense. So the part of the word that is needed to create its meaning. It's the root of the word that can stand alone. We'll look at it in um, more detail here because we'll still keep using stems and what we'll be we'll, we'll looking at affixation now. Um, and affixation happens with prefixes, suffixes, and infixes. They're all morphemes attaching to the stems of words in different ways. So a prefix is when you add a morpheme before the stem. That's why it's called pre. Okay. So bicycle, international, prenatal, schizophrenia, supersonic. We see all of these in blue are morphemes that have been added before the stem. So what's the stem? <clears throat> of course, it's the, this part. Cycle is the stem. Cycle without the E is the stem of, of the... Is, sorry, cycle with the E is the stem. Um, national is the stem. Natal is the stem. Phrenia is the stem. Sonic, sexual, those are all stems. So a prefix is if there's something added that goes before the stem. A suffix is where a morpheme is added after the stem. So it's the opposite of a prefix. And we see some examples highlighted here. For example, clockwise. Clock is the stem. Wise. It seems like a different word, I know, uh, but it's a suffix that's been added. Now, an infix is where it gets a bit more complicated because this is where we stick a morpheme within the stem. So fan bloody tastic. You can see it's literally um, divided though um, in all of these examples and that's how you'll always usually see them. Okay. Um, and that's why infixes will be easy to find. Just please uh, note uh, that a fan and tastic are not two different stems it's one stem that's been split and the infix has been added all right morphemes are also divided into free and bound morphemes free morphemes are ones that can just stand alone by themselves you could say it's kind of like the stem of the word right you could you could say it's the same thing free morphemes stand on alone and still make sense so teach is a free morpheme if you just write down the word teach, that has meaning by itself. It would also be the stem of, of a word, you could say. Bound morphemes cannot stand alone. If they're not combined with other morphemes, they don't make any sense. So looking at teacher, er is bound because er doesn't make sense by itself. They need to combine to teach, to make teacher. Beautiful. And then the last sort of type of morphemes are inflectional slash derivational basically the same thing they're just synonyms uh, usually people call them inflectional morphemes and we've got these for adjectives nouns and verbs so i've literally just put a table list because <clears throat> there's a limited amount and this is all of them okay um so it's probably easier to remember the examples than just the morpheme by itself so in a way they do create inflection they add a bit of meaning grammatically to a word for example uh s for the plural of koalas right this morpheme is just helping to show that something is a plural um and not one item and that's a lot of our inflectional morphemes they just make um grammatical meaning to words um suffixation in australian english this is huge i don't expect um, i'm not going to sit here and read all of this um hopefully you recognize a lot of these 
Um, remember, suffixes are the morphemes at the ends of words um, changing. <laughs> so we have a lot of unique ones in Australia, especially O and um, double consonants, i.e. endings. Um, and this is important when you look at Australian English and you can identify these examples of suffixation as informal features, okay, for an informal text. Still looking at morphology and lexicology, when we think about lexicology and what leads to the creation of new words, um, I've included the factors that drive word formation and create and help to create new words. Um, one is technology. We see a couple of words that have been created as a result of technology, clickbait, backspace, um, wars and conflict as well. Just think about how much vocabulary and the way people have spoken has changed from the Norman conquest to Middle English times. Identity, personal identity, as well as community identity. Some words have been included here as well um, as different, more and more different identities have become accepted by society. More words have um, resulted and societal change. So just think about the current prevailing government and maybe you can think of some words that <coughs> have been created as a result. Parliament can also legislate definitions of new words to make it less confusing and in that way even create words in a sense by giving them that specific definition via legislation. Recent example, this happened with um, cybersecurity because people um, were very confused about terminology with regards to cybersecurity. So the government actually put out legislation to define it for use. Um, and these are the kinds of uh, word formations. So this is all of this falls under a big umbrella term of word formation. So a blend, two words blended together. We see that spoon and fork, spork, acronyms, NASA. If something is an acronym, we don't pronounce it as N-A-S-A. -A. That's an initialism, okay? Something is an acronym. These are being pronounced as syllables, NASA. Initialisms, each letter is pronounced separately. Make sure not to get confused between the two. Shortenings, flu is a shortening. Compounding, textbook, putting two words together, but not blending them so it's only parts of them, like in a blend but actually putting them together. So text and book, making one word. Um, contractions, don't. So obviously always see this um, symbol whenever something is a contraction. So won't is a contraction of will not. Don't is a contraction of do not. Collocations, an example is fake news. Conversion, Uber, this used to be. Um, an act, this has been converted uh, from into uh, from a business name into uh, a noun and a verb as well. Neologisms means quite literally means new, very new words. Um, borrowings words taken from other languages. Um, and I recommend just gathering some more uh, examples for each of these. Um, so we'll look at conversion in more in more detail um, from this list. Conversion of word class is when um, sometimes existing words change their part of speech, but the initial meaning isn't necessarily lost. Um, so nouns often changing into verbs is the most common. The meaning isn't necessarily lost. OK, but it can be used in a different way in a sentence. That's why I said Uber, you know, can be it used to be just a business name, but now it's a noun. It's a verb. Also, uh, I'm Ubering somewhere. OK, that's standard to say. So conversion has occurred, but conversion has to involve no added morphemes. 
there isn't a prefix or a suffix or an infix that just appears. So inbox me as an example. Inbox just used to be a noun. It can be used as a verb as well. Has been for a long time now. Another one of these um, interesting things we can do is nominalization. And that's uh, making something nouny in a more, to give you more comprehensive definition. Um, it's to make something that sound fancy. We take a word that isn't a noun. So it's going to be a different word class and it is commonly a verb, an adjective or an adverb um, as a noun or as the head of a noun phrase. So I reflected, reflected is a verb, but we've changed the sentence, we've changed the sentence and put a noun phrase at the head of this, uh, at the head of the sentence upon reflection. Reflection has become a noun. So it's taking taking words and making them now need to make them sound fancy. As you can imagine, this is associated with formal register more commonly. So look at sentence structures and sentence types. Um, so simple sentences are exactly as they sound. They only have one coordinate clause. As an example, I like dogs. So it, it will be a standard uh, subject, verb, object sort of structure. I, me, the subject, like, verb, like what, object, dogs. Now, a compound sentence will have two parts to it. So you can even imagine it as subject, verb, verb object, plus subject, verb, object. Two coordinate clauses. I like dogs is one. Then there's but. And I don't like cats is the second clause. <clears throat> when we look at complex sentences, they have one coordinate clause and one subordinate clause. Basically, you can view a subordinate clause as um, an incomplete clause. I like dogs is our coordinate clause because they are affectionate. So this is just uh, they, which, which is our subject, the dogs, is just making a reference back to that. And our affectionate, just a verb, okay? Subject, verb, object, subject, verb, in a nutshell. So that's a subordinate clause. A compound complex sentence is like a combination of these two. And it takes two coordinate clauses and one subordinate clause. I like dogs, one coordinate clause, but I don't like cats a second coordinate clause because they are not affectionate. That's our subordinate clause. Hopefully it's easier to understand this when the example is like sort of repeating. Um, and then we've got sentence fragments, which are just non-standard incomplete units. So if we take yeah the other day, does that have a subject or a verb? Not really, it just mentions the other day as an object. There's nothing carrying out an action or doing an action, doing some kind of action or something that the sentence is indicating towards. And it's also very short. Sentence fragments are usually very short. So look for that subject verb object um, structure and break sentences into those. And that way you'll be able to identify coordinate subordinate clauses and decide what type of sentence structure something is. Oh, sorry. I just realized it's going to get stuck on uh, making each thing pop up. We'll look at sentence types, not to be confused with sentence structures. So, a declarative sentence acts as a statement. It just states something. These are probably the most common. I like dogs. That's a declaration, a statement. An interrogative sentence poses a question. For example, do you like dogs? Imperative sentences give a command. For example, you must pat my, pat my dog. You need to do this, okay? And exclamative sentences are like an outburst. Dogs are awesome. That should all be very nice and easy to understand, and it will probably be easier to, ident to identify than sentence structures. 
Um, okay, as we continue to look at syntax, I think we're up to now, we're going to look at voice. Um, Vika doesn't exactly need you to know the terms, but uh, it helps in the subject overall. Uh, hopefully, talking about it today makes it easier to understand. And even though it's not required, you can discuss the significance of passive versus active voice. So first, we'll introduce a couple of terms. The agent is the one doing the verb, kind of like how I was talking about a subject being a sentence in a sentence before. So it, the agent is the one doing the verb. The patient is the one receiving the verb. So for example, in the sentence, Dr. Johnson chaired the meeting, Dr. Johnson is the agent because the agent is chairing, carrying out in action, the meeting. And the meeting becomes the patient because it's the one being chaired. All right, it's the one receiving the verb. In this example, the household, the household is the agent, welcomed the newcomers. The newcomers are being welcomed, therefore they are the patient. So active versus passive voice, let's have a look at an example. Active, an active voice sentence, the agent subject is going at the front, not always, but usually. It's how you can spot them. Patty is the agent carrying out the action, watering the plants. The plants are being watered as the object. But in a passive sentence, for some reason, the patient tends to go, the patient has moved to the beginning of the phrase or sentence. Um, and it makes the sentence literally sound passive. The plants were watered by Patty. And this is done intentionally for some reason, if you see this in a book or something, for some reason that would make the reader draw their attention to the plants rather than Patty. By giving it the structure and putting the patient at the front um, and giving so much emphasis to the fact that an action is being carried out to the plants and not by who, it, uh, it emphasizes that part of the sentence, the patient, okay? We do need an auxiliary verb. Um, so were was added to make that stick. Um, and the agent becomes an adverbial starting with by. So to signify who the agent is in the sentence. So in a passive sentence, the agent is an adverbial. And adverbials are also optional, so they can just be omitted. For instance, instead of the plants were watered by Patty, by with the adverbial, we can just take this off and remove the agent completely and just leave the patient when we're writing a passive voice sentence. The plants were watered. But if the agent is removed like this in a passive sentence, it's not called just a passive sentence. Now it's called an agentless passive because it doesn't have it, the agent anymore. So that should all be very easy. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Next, looking at syntax, we're going to have, going to have a look at syntactic patterning. Um, and I have included a little text here as an example. So the few types that you need to know, parallelism and antithesis are the opposites of one another. When you see antithesis in a sentence, you see opposite concepts being placed side by side. When you draw parallels between things, it means those things are similar, right? So parallelism is when we see similar sentence structures and listing is what it is, listing things. So let's have a look at this example. What can we find here? We are a nation, ancient and modern, old and new. If you had a question asking you to find an example of syntactic patterning in here, um, what would it be? Just have a little think. We can see ancient and modern and old and new are opposites, doesn't make any sense. So antithesis is happening here. Um, students do confuse parallelism and antithesis somehow weirdly, um, but remember parallelism, similar things, antithesis, opposite things, right? Um, so why would this be done if we're writing about the function? Obviously emphasizes, um, draws attention um, in this case. So, 
our second last subsystem, we're looking at discourse, usually involved with speech, speaking to uh, the broader parts of a text, um, discourse features, and then we'll look at semantics, which is the study of meaning. We just looked at syntax, which is sentences coming together and and we finish that. So the concepts that you need to know under discourse are cohesion and coherence. Again, these can form the basis of paragraphs in your analytical commentary. You can literally write about cohesion and coherence or one of them um, as a body paragraph. <clears throat> so we'll look at what uh, falls under each umbrella term. Cohesion is how a text is linguistically linked together and how it all comes together to make sense. But coherence is how easy it is to read and understand. Think more broadly about the text when you think about coherence. How did the sentence, the logical flow, how do those things come together to make it nice and easy to read or really, or it's really po poorly structured and you keep getting confused about what it's trying to do. So looking at cohesion firstly, uh, one factor that contributes to cohesion is whether there's anaphoric and cataphoric references. You can use these as evidence. This visual helps to explain it, but an anaphoric ref reference is when a pronoun refers backwards. So think about when you're reading a book, you don't see the same noun, whatever the subject of the article is, being repeated over and over and over and over again. The name of the concept may have been stated and then in the next sentence if it needs to mention that concept again it's just going to refer to it as it okay so that's an end of anaphoric reference after stating the name of the concept that the piece is talking about in the next sentence it wants to refer to it again to make it shorter and easier to to read more cohesive it just calls it it um um, a cataphoric reference is the opposite, though. It's when a pronoun is being used to refer to something that's mentioned further on in the text. Okay, um, so it might be they use both of these references try to make us um, assume and fill in the gaps of what it's talking about, and we usually never have an issue with it if something's well written. It doesn't matter that a concept is only named two or three times every single time we read the thing it we know that it's talking about the thing that the article is about okay so a cataphoric reference refers forwards and an anaphoric reference refers backwards all right now what about coherence the 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 really big uh one interestingly cohesion as well falls under um falls under uh coherence okay but do treat it as a separate one for the sake of of the subject but of course it they're interlinked and cohesion affects coherence as well but additional factors include inference so inference is um understanding due to background or outside knowledge so when you read some kind of article or text there is a lot of things that aren't explicitly said because it is assumed that the reader will fill those gaps in from their general knowledge and, and keeping up with the world. Um, okay, so there's inference in every every single um, text, really. What if inference is poorly done? Well, it would be expecting that the audience could assume something that is way too difficult to understand for example it could be a, like a scientific article <clears throat> that is way too complex for just a normal person to understand unless unless they do have background knowledge so that may be inaccessible to a lot of readers um logical ordering as well text level ordering of information so for example if i'm reading an opinion piece i would expect the arguments to flow in a logical way the text shouldn't jump between argument one to argument two to argument one to argument three to argument two it will go argument one two three okay so that's logical ordering formatting of a text quite literally means how a text is formatted um, if it's formatted in a good way you could for example 
talk about the formatting of these PowerPoint slides and whether it makes them more coherent or not. Um, so things like using a big font to make it easier to read, making it neat, um, bolding some of the words to indicate that they're significant, consistency, the consistency of a text and conventions, each text type should follow its own conventions. Think about the conventions of a newspaper versus a novel. Okay, so newspaper, you'll, you, you would expect to see a headline, images, um, subheadings. <clears throat> a novel would just be um, the same format on each page, much smaller letters, only chapter names, etc. All right. On to our last subsystem, semantics, the study of meaning. We'll first begin with semantic field or domain. Hopefully you guys are familiar with this one. But a semantic field is a collection of related words that relate to one another. So all of these belong to the same semantic field. Operations manager, inputs, waste minimization, supply chain, productivity, unfair dismissal, GDP. So <clears throat> putting all of those words, um, all of these words are interlinked, so they belong to the same semantic field. And a semantic field, you can also name what that big overarching category is. Um, I'm seeing GDP, productivity as well, operations matter. So I'm thinking maybe like economics in this case, or there are some words that relate to employment in general, uh, but economics. Um, the other umbrella term is semantic patterning um, and a few things here that I'll try to explain best that I can. Irony, everyone know, everyone's heard the, the phrase being ironic, um, but it's when you say one thing, but you mean the opposite. Saying one meaning, but meaning the opposite of it. A metaphor is a figure of speech that directly relates to things. So metaphors indirectly describe something by describing something else. They use an example of something else to describe a thing and create that mental picture. A simile is a figure of speech that compares two things. Similes be can be dis distinguished because they have the word like um <clears throat> so something is being compared um maybe uh, i'm just trying to think of a phrase but you see the word like uh so maybe like sleeping like a log for example something is sleeping like a log that's a simile because it has the word like there Oxymorons are contradictions of words, words directly contradicting each other. More semantic patterning. Puns are a type of wordplay that exploit the multiple meanings of one word. Um, so uh, you might see even things like it's, it's rhyming together. Um, lexical ambiguity, on the other hand, doesn't try to exploit that the word has multiple meanings and make them all known but it aims to be unclear, ambiguous. It gives a word that is confusing in meaning and could mean two things or more. When we um, personify something, we assign human qualities to an object that is inanimate, or you might be assigning them to an animal as well and making them like a human. And animation instead takes um, an inanimate, not living object and gives it animal qualities rather than human qualities. More on semantics, some other terms uh, we'd like to introduce. Synonymy is words that have the same or similar meaning, such as clever and intelligent. Antonymy is the opposite meaning, when words have the opposite meaning or very different meaning. Honesty and deceit are examples. Remember that they don't have to be exactly the same meaning, exactly the opposite meaning. It just means same or similar, opposite or very different. Okay. Um, hyponymy is when something is a subclass of something else. So a dugong is a type of mammal. Okay. So they fall, it's a big category and more things um, 
uh, and it's classed into more things, into more subclasses. Idioms are all the common phrases and sayings that are overused, um, generalized sayings such as spill the beans, denotation, when you say when you ask for the denotation of something, you're asking for the dictionary definition, how it would be literally defined. Whereas when you ask for the connotations of something, you're asking for what's implied, what emotions, feelings, and other things come to mind when you think of it. So if someone told you, uh, this person is inquisitive, you start assuming that they're nosy. That's not exactly what inquisitive means by dictionary definition. And um, there's a lot more potential meanings that it has, but maybe when it was said about that specific person, you assumed it was talking about them being nosy. If it was said about something else, maybe you'd think that uh, when this word is used to describe another person, it makes me feel as though they're going to interrogate me in a more threatening way than nosy. Um, cool. We'll finish up with meta language terms. I know it is a lot, but you'll need this basis for the rest of the year. Um, on this slide, it's just a bunch of other meta language terms. Basically, go get your um, new study design for 2024, print it out, look for all the um, meta language lists, and try to make sure you're all across it. Don't stress too much about things that you will be using more when unit. Uh, four comes around in the second half of the year, um, but uh, familiarize yourselves with uh, terms you'll need to know. <clears throat> On to our second half. So now we're going to look at register beginning with informal language. Remember I said register is a spectrum, almost no text, not uh, all of them, um, are completely formal or completely informal. So try to stand out, especially in your ACs, by um, for every formal text, find an informal feature or two. For every formal, uh, for every informal text, find a formal feature or two, if possible. Sometimes it won't be. Um, and don't be too definitive when defining the register. Um, so for the features we look at for informal language, note that these relate to the meta language that we've just covered and gone through. Um, in terms of phonetics and phonology, uh, we looked at connected speech processes and phonological patterning. Um, these um, uh, everything that falls under these umbrella terms is more often related to informal features. So you can use these to show that the register is informal and analyze why those features are there and how they reinforce register. Um, so for connected speech processes, for instance, relaxed pronunciation might be shown through non-standard spelling. You call spelling orthography as well in English language. So that's another word I would add to your vocab list. Um, so it shows relaxed pronunciation if we have non-standard orthography. Connected speech processes are also casual and they lower formality and they help to build rapport. Um, in terms of phonological patterning, if it can be linked to amusing or persuading functions um, and the social purpose of building rapport, all of these things associated with informal register more so. For morphology and lexicology, if you think a text is informal, look for and analyze slang and colloquial language, informal language and slang terms. Look for Australian suffixation, those double consonants, i.e. O endings. Um, Australian suffixation shows that a text is casual and formal and there's a relaxed, uh, relaxed relationship between the interlocutors, if you can spot it. Um, it also builds rapport and promotes a sense of national identity and belonging. Um, Look, look for neologisms, those new words, and any of those creative word formations as well that we've looked at. It makes a text engaging and playful. For syntax, uh, expect that there will be all types of sentence uh, structures, okay? But if a text is truly informal and it hasn't been planned, which we're looking for, uh, expect there to be more 
simple sentence structures with only one clause. Um, because it isn't planned, so we'd expect to see less sentences simply. Look also for sentence fragments. It's likely to be a bit more sentence fragments in an informal text. For semantics, look for all the types of semantic patterning that we've just looked at. It might be doing something like creating humor through a pun, um, cr creating entertaining or funny descriptions through things like a simile, okay? Using those cliche sayings, those idioms, um, and we can connect that to informal language as well. There may also be more taboo language. Haven't looked at taboo today, but it's all those topics that are controversial to mention in society. Imagine there's a relaxed relationship, close relationship between the interlocutors, um, and they feel comfortable enough simply so they can say what's on their mind without fearing that it's going to cause offense. So they can bridge those taboo topics. For discourse, um, looking at the features of spoken discourse, we're mainly looking for any sign that the text is not planned. That's what informal language is all about. It should be not planned. Um, so things like pauses and false starts could signal nervousness or someone's just collecting their thoughts, indicating a text is informal. Maybe non-fluency features, stammering, stopping a sentence, starting it again, overlapping speech, interruptions, each person is talking over the other because they're relaxed and they won't take offense if they interrupt, things like that. Now, the formal features that you want to look for are everything that's the opposite of what we've looked at, okay? Um, but I've still created a more comprehensive list for everyone. <clears throat> so elevated lexies, also known as our big fancy words, longer words with more syllables and fancy sounds, those nominalizations, those nouny words, when we take a verb and change it into a noun, uh, making it sound longer and fancier and stick it at the start of a sentence. Passive construction, so remember back to our passive voice and our agentless passive. Um, sophisticated syntactic structures, there'll be more longer sentences and more complex sentence structures such as our compound complex for instance planned patterning any indication that a text is planned is what you want to look for so j literally look for a lack of these things you know an indication a lack of pauses false starts you can analyze a pause that appears to have been intentionally done to create emphasis as a formal feature because that indicates oh this speech was planned this person made um a really clearly planned pause to draw emphasis to an idea for instance so anything that indicates planned patterning whether that's phonological features lexical features or syntactic features um look for jargon jargon is the language sort of used in a specific field or a domain so, for example, if you work in a certain career, you might know lots of jargon terms, lots of words that only people um, involved in that field really use. As an English language student, you have jargon pertaining to English language and you hope to build that up over this year. Look for conventional formatting, especially if the text is in the written mode and it's printed rather than just a transcript of a speech look to see that it follows conventional standard formatting expected for that text type and it's neat and tidy and you would expect high levels of cohesion and coherence that we just looked at heaps of logical ordering everything flows in a manner that makes sense uh we're not jumping from idea to idea beautiful so that's all of our little introduction on register. So as you can see, this is the majority of your unit phrase register, okay? So just by knowing the concepts and understanding meta language, you would already be able to write on register as long as you have an idea in your head or in your notes of what features to look for, for formal register and informal register, you already have 
the basis to be able to write about register and for example write an analytical commentary paragraph about register in your given text so now we'll actually look at the analytical commentary don't cover it in a lot of detail i think um come back later on in the year to like april lectures uh or july lectures when but a lot of these are just trying to give you a head start um <clears throat> so the analytical commentary were 30 marks on the exam, quite literally specifies in that prompt, this is just a transcript of the same thing, specifies that you need to write about contextual factors affecting and surrounding the text. That's the first piece of content that we started with when we looked at the big ideas. So remember I said all of those elements like the mode, the function, the social uh, purpose, all of that should be mentioned in your introduction. So you introduce the text and state its contextual factors and main ideas like the social purpose. Um, and then social purpose and register of the text, stylistic and discourse features of the text. So basically, you aim to use evidence from as many of all the subsystems as possible to cover as many big ideas about the text that are pertaining to that specific text as possible. So a lot of students use uh, different approaches and we'll look at the two approaches, the subsystem approach and the big ideas approach. Both are okay to use. I personally prefer the big ideas approach because it's difficult to score well unless you covered every key idea for a specific text in your AC. It's not likely that you're going to get one of the really high marks, just for the really high marks. Um, so it's better, I find, to focus on distinct ideas, the style of the text structure, how it all comes together, what meaning it holds by discussing elements from different subsystems and jumping around the different subsystems in order to, to do this, than to write with a focus on subsystems, uh, which leads a lot of students to miss a lot of big picture important ideas by writing a paragraph on an entire subsystem um, alone. <clears throat> so what can what what are the contextual factors? Remember, we should um, some of this will go in your intro. Other things you can even write a paragraph about if you find it significant. So where the text took place or, or where it was printed, where it appeared, what the time period was. What was the mode? Was it written or spoken? These kinds of things in the intro. Primary function or functions of the text. I recommend for everything in English language, try to identify more than one. So if you're writing about function, try to find a main function and a secondary function, okay? And write about both. So you'd mention these in your intro, and then a function is a suitable um, idea for a body paragraph. So you might write a body paragraph combining, for most of it, you discuss the primary function that you've identified. And for the second half, you discuss the um, uh, secondary function in short, bit shorter terms, okay? Um, okay. So um, you also wanna talk about the, uh, relationship between interlocutors, if that's relevant, uh, what role the speakers play, if there's any social power relation. So this is where I mentioned, look for whether there is a power imbalance between them, because that may be significant to analyze. Think about who the audience are and whether there's more than one target audience, whether there's a secondary audience, who the speakers are, their age, gender, and occupation, any other relevant details, and what is the field or the topic of the conversation. Remember semantic field? How do you write about a semantic field? Well, you look for all of those uh, words that fall under one semantic field, and you can quote them, put the line numbers, and discuss why those words have been used and how that identifies a clear semantic field. So for all and most of these things, my recommendation in English language is look for more than one, look for more than one semantic field and identify how the topic of the conversation changes and how 
that happens, how how it flows, analyze that structure. Um, and that's context our contextual factors. So we'll move through social purpose and register. We've looked at today um, as well. Identify more than one social purpose. Try to identify a main one and a secondary one, whether the text is formal or informal or somewhere in between. If the language being used is in a certain variety or a style, is there a particular tone to the piece and does that change throughout? So a lot of ACs that I used to write in year 12 using the big ideas approach, I used to follow a structure of having big body paragraphs and small body paragraphs and having maybe five, six body paragraphs, something like that. Some of them being very, very short, others being longer. So I used to have a social purpose paragraph for pretty much everything because it's literally in the VCA criteria and a register paragraph. Um, and I would try to identify both formal and informal features, identify secondary social purpose. Uh, I would look for which contextual factors were interesting enough that I could make a mini body paragraph from them um, and look for anything that is important that I really should write about. Oftentimes fields were important for my informal texts. Uh, power imbalances I always looked for and relationship um looked for uh any potential significance of cohesion and coherence always because i had an aim to cover not only how the structure of the text overall is created but also all the sort of layers of meaning what the text sets out to do those contextual factors and that's as a student your ac needs to aim to have a really high level of coverage of anything important in a text in order to do well. So I recommend just writing as much as possible, working with different texts every time, because you need to write a different AC for everything. You need to be able to change your approach, change the ideas for your body paragraphs, depending on the material that you're given. Um, and that's going to take a lot of time and practice, Students do only about average if they have an idea of, I always write these par paragraphs for my ACs. No matter what text I'm given, I'm going to write about cohesion and coherence as a body paragraph and analyze it in the text. No matter what I'm given, I'm going to write about register in the text that I'm given and give it a paragraph. No matter what I'm given, I'm going to write about function. So you need to be able to adapt your approach um okay and lastly because of course wants those stylistic and discourse features of the text and that's all your subsystems so aim to have evidence i recommend from at least three subsystems throughout your ac just as part of each paragraph try to make sure you're not just talking about a big one is just lexicology um try to make sure in each paragraph, you're talking um, about at least two of the subsystems. When you're quoting evidence to analyze as part of your body of your AC, make sure every paragraph is doing it from at least a couple of the subsystems and not just one. Which ones are the ones that are easiest to do? Lexicology, a lot of students have trouble doing anything else other than lexicology. Um, don't be one of those students. Look for morphology. We looked at it. It's it's quite easy. Um, hopefully you found that quite easy to understand. You know, your free, bound, prefix, suffix, infix, very easy things to find. Um, syntax is quite easy to do and discourse and semantics to apply to everything. And if you want to show off, try to stick phonology and phonetics every once in a while. But if you do have a spoken text that has been a transcript of a spoken text for your AC, just because of the mode that the text is in, you need to be covering phonology and phonetics, right? Um, because it does have phonology and phonetics in that text. So just be really, really aware of that. Whatever is relevant has to be written about and analyzed. Everything else is a choice, but you're aiming for optimal coverage of anything important. The good news is, and you may have been thinking, Sunny, how did you do five to six paragraphs? You don't need a conclusion. 
the paragraphs don't really I know some teachers teach it like there needs to be a super clear starting sentence and super clear starting ending sentence ending sentence to each paragraph but you don't need that you don't need like a good starting sentence is quite crucial but an ending sentence for each paragraph is not in my view and the way I wrote was just focusing on being clear getting to the point not rambling and then that you know AC with five to six body paragraphs of varying lengths in an intro it didn't it wasn't that long it was 800 words or something like that okay so it's 100% doable you don't need a conclusion for an AC but I will say that you should finish your AC in a way that makes sense so finish the AC on a topic one of those big ideas uh that and, and link it back to the big ideas of the text like the last piece of evidence that you're analyzing um is something that you link back to a big idea maybe a big idea one of those that was mentioned in the in your introduction in your beginning <laughs> for instance something to link back to the overall cohesion and or coherence of the text remember not to conflate them together something that can be brought brought back to the major spoken discourse strategies of the given text or their function or purpose and in that way just add a nice concluding tone to the end of your ac but you don't need to start a conclusion paragraph what is necessary is you should have an intro and at least three body paragraphs if you're following the standard long body paragraph structure students that i've had um and Turing students that i've had as well whoever i taught the structure to of um having a mix between longer body paragraphs shorter body paragraphs so you could have more coverage and write about a lot of different things every student has like really liked it um so i do suggest try it if it's something you're interested in when you go on examiner's reports for English language, um, you can see a lot of high scoring students doing it and you can read through some e essays that they've written for older exams. So jump online and have a look if you're interested. But like I said, there's two main ways, the subsystem method and the big ideas method. Essentially, students use one or the other. The subsystem method is uh, quite specific it's when a student um writes their main body paragraphs based on subsystems so they have for example a paragraph about the lexical features within the ac text and they're analyzing them linking them to different big ideas contextual features etc um they have one on morphology and all the pieces of evidence that they've taken link into different ideas and have their own analysis and a last one for example on syntax okay and the big ideas method goes if i want to write a paragraph about register i will and i will use evidence from whatever subsystems i want from throughout the text um function social purpose cohesion coherence um or even if i think if i'm writing using the big ideas method i can even write a subsystem paragraph because at some point i find that to be relevant so somehow in that ac one of the paragraphs actually ends up being directly about a system like phonetics and phonology for a spoken text um so just based on my description and if you did ACs in year 11 and you use the subsystem method I just urge you just to try the big ideas method I'm a big advocate for it and I think it's just so much more flexible and fun to write with alone but it's also easier to get those super high marks with the big ideas method in my opinion just because of the flexibility it offers and how it lets you write in whatever style to get the coverage that you need to cover all the important ideas um it allows you to have an overarching theme for each of your paragraphs uh it makes sure that you have an analytical idea basically backing each paragraph it helps to ensure that it improves flow it's 
exploring more interesting ideas with more freedom and allows you to go into more depth in your analysis. It doesn't make you move on. Oh, I need the next piece of evidence. If I want to analyze in more depth, I can stop and do that because I'm writing about a big idea anyway. That being said, the subsystem approach and the big ideas approach, they can both get those high, 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 high marks. I don't want to discredit anything, absolutely not. Um, I'm just saying that I personally think, and a lot of people would agree, that it's a bit easier to do with the big ideas approach. And um, it's also a bit more fun to write with the big ideas approach because of that flexibility. Um, but this is a high scoring analytical commentary paragraph based around the subsystem approach um, and it's around discourse. So let's have a read through. This is a really good paragraph. As a spoken conversation, discourse features are prevalent throughout the text. Overlapping speech is common in spontaneous conversation, as is the case for C and A. We should have full names as, as well in, in analytical commentary, but it's okay because it's a transcript. So notice that the intro introductory sentence of the paragraph introduces that the paragraph will be about discourse, okay? And then jump straight into evidence from the discourse subsystem. Talking about overlapping speech and connecting it to an analytical idea just about the conversation being spontaneous, unplanned, that could be linked to informal register as well. On lines two to three, for example, C starts to speak over A, presumably because C guesses how A will finish her sentence. Yep, just the books. So we see our first piece of evidence, line numbers have been attached, and that's just the background information for the evidence. Um, and this is the this shows that it's spontaneous, this conversation, it hasn't been planned. But overlapping speech or interruptions is also used for floor management, who has the turn to speak. On line 87, for example, A takes the floor from C. By speaking, when C was still taking a turn, A indicated that she wanted to take back the floor. <clears throat> so that's a really good connection to make to the informal register present here because they just interrupt as they please to take the floor and they don't mind. They don't mind. Turn taking is indicated in several other ways. For instance, C initially asks a number of questions, encouraging A to take a turn would be improved by using a meta language to describe them as interrogative sentences. Um, but the discourse, the subsystem approach confines you and you can't say interrogative sentences because then you're going into syntax and this is all about discourse, right? So you can see what I mean <coughs> about flexibility. Similarly, C often marks the ends of returns with falling intonation. C appears dominant in topic management, which may reflect her structural power as employee rather than a customer. We see the power imbalance being um, discussed. Uh, sorry, the power dynamics in this case being discussed, which is linking to a big idea through discourse. C introduces new topics, uh, again, linking to a contextual feature. That's what Vika wants us to do. Um, giving evidence that shows there are different semantic fields and linking to another big idea, function. This allows C and A to adhere to both functions of the text as the topic is managed between the primary function the transaction, and other topics, namely to build social rapport. Non-fluency features are also rife, supporting the spontaneity and informality of the text. So we did finally bring it back to the big idea of register. I thought that link could be made nicely up at the top two. Um, and lots of evidence has been given of informality. Linking back again to the big idea, social purpose of building rapport. So um, looking at this example, this is a great example because it has heaps of evidence and nothing that you read is irrelevant. As English language students, I urge you to aim to learn to write in a way where there is zero irrelevant information and everything is giving the assessor something to work with, something important, 
unless you do come across that really interesting analytical idea that you want to break down in a bit more detail. So this is a great example of having a huge amount of coverage with just the paragraph alone. Um, you can imagine from this student's discourse paragraph, if you actually read the piece of text and you thought about the discourse there, you'd probably think that they hit the nail on the head and they covered anything and everything that was important there. <clears throat> but as I said, the big idea is method you can be so flexible with as well. Try both, see what works for you. As I said, you change the focus of your body paragraphs every single time, depending on what you think is most appropriate and depending on the text that you are working with. There is no limit to how creative you can get and how many ideas there are. Some little tips for analytical commentaries as you um, start to write these this year. Um, whenever you're quoting something in any section of the exam, try to use meta language that is as precise as possible. Um, I think I mentioned this before. Always attach meta language to terms. In fact, stop yourself. Don't put anything down as evidence, as a quote, um, until you can give it a name, assign it a name. It's not a word. And if the only the best thing you can think of is the word, say the lexeme. And then we see you get more and more specific. Uh, use the word class. Be really familiar with the word classes because, because that will give you a sprinkle of meta language to literally anything and everything that you will write. Um, and always try to find the levels of complexity to get good marks in an AC. So I identified a method, look for at least two of everything and look to have that really good coverage to, so that when the assessor reads your AC, they feel like you've completely broken down the style and any and all big ideas and contextual factors that are relevant. Literally do little plans, annotate your AC text and write down anything you think is important to cover for that AC. From bigger ideas to a specific piece of evidence you found that you really want to break down and analyze. Okay, so looking for more than one social purpose, more than one function, writing double-sided body paragraphs where it's not just about the one thing but something else has been linked in. And remember that you need to link things together. So we just read in the discourse paragraph that different things were being linked. The features of the discourse were being linked to show how the text wasn't planned. And then that somehow was linked to the fact that um, the different uh, power statuses of the participants in the discourse, the interlocutors. Um, <clears throat> so try to, try, to, try to do those things when you're writing analytical commentaries. Find conflicts, contents, complex, complexities, and dynamic shifts use the word whilst, try to contradict yourself where you can, um, look for conflicts within the language itself, look for the language trying to do one thing but then it strays from that and it's doing something else. Um, and ensure that you're not using absolutes in your writing, use those low modality verbs and use less definitive language. Never say something completely with confidence, completely definitively. The most definitive words you can use are probably like predominantly when you're using that for register. Um, but this little vocab sheet, feel free to add to it. Words like aids, supports, contributes to, reflects, constructs, creates. You could add more to this list. Highly appropriate for your ACs. And importantly, make sure you're doing an English language style of analysis exactly like what we looked at. It should be very uh, technical. Um, it should be delving into the intricacies, either zooming in into um, construction of the text and how all the elements come together or zooming out into those bigger ideas and bigger picture ideas, okay? Um, and that's that English language style of analysis. Line numbers for everything. Everything should be succinct and have a lot of coverage. And this is especially um, important if you're doing more than one English subject. 
to make sure that you're writing in an appropriate style and don't treat English language as the same as your other um, English subject. Um, treat them as different. This is an acquired skill. Until you took English language, you never had to write in this way. You wouldn't have written while all the other students are writing essays like they did in years one to ten. Um, in a similar style, just more advanced, you've kind of had to take on a completely different style that you've never written in. Um, so don't don't be hard on yourself. Just practice. It takes time and it gets easier. Look at lots of examples. Look at examiner's reports. Um, and Vika's important advice, beware of simply listing features. Remember to identify, exemplify, and explain the links to context and purpose. Don't just include evidence and quote things for the sake of it. Make sure to name everything using meta language. Describe any context surrounding it that may be needed to make that information make sense. And then create a link um, <clears throat> to important ideas and the ideas that are assessed. And importantly, try and capture the flavor of the text. This is all about the coverage that I spoke about. Um, really try to make the style of the text apparent and all the major stylistic choices of the author with regards to you know the big choices they make in each subsystem why have they done them and linking all of that to contextual ideas and our big ideas function social purpose etc <clears throat> so that should be your goal as a student okay our last section is our frequently asked questions and tips just a little bit of tips to finish up with. How to study for English language. First question, and how did I study for English language? I have um, really suggest revising your meta language a lot. Um, I had a big section in my notes, pretty much kept a book of notes that was just like the meta language terms. I wish that instead, um, I use something like cue cards to keep my information a little bit more organized, um, have examples for everything, and have those general purposes of different techniques written out so you can apply them more narrowly to specific texts. Practice choosing the most relevant examples from a text, those that can be linked to big ideas. Um, First of all, understand the big ideas, then take text and do uh, an annotation and annotation activity and, and an activity where you put, um, you write down, if I wrote an AC, what are the things that I really should be covering? Write lots, get, feed, get feedback on everything and importantly, reflect on the feedback and actually plan, write down how you're going to change whether that's issues in your writing or areas where you have gaps, don't just leave it and forget about it, but work on it so you can improve. Uh, we'll talk about essays later on. It's um, not the time yet for that. It's for later on in the year, but you will have to be prepared for a wide range of essay topics and create plans for how to attack essays because they can be on almost everything. For that, you'll also need to collect quotes and examples. I'm just going to briefly mention this today, but this is not something that you need to worry about yet. It's a bit um, early, unless you really want a head start. But basically, yep, you need examples. We won't be talking about essays today. That's in our July session because it's more unit four. Um, but now's a good time to just start looking for the, for the most recent things that happen. Ideally, you would do this all year, okay? And as new things happen and you notice new words and things emerging and interesting quotes, you just keep doing it all year so it never gets overwhelming. This is not one of those things you can really do in the last month in the lead up to the exam because you need to remember so much. Um, Vika will want your examples for essays, your quotes to be from 2024, the current year that you are studying. Um, and this is often mentioned in the examination report that this is an expectation and an issue. 
So now you're thinking, what kind of examples? The examples basically are based around essay prompts that you could potentially get. Um, I loved the English language essays. I know the examples is kind of daunting, but you basically don't really need it's it, you have so much freedom to just express opinions and you can create your own structure that is nice and flows well and then every single time you're just writing um basically around your own opinions um and it's really interesting so if, if you start on it early it will be easier um, but all the categories that the prompts can be around, they've never been announced or published by Vika, and it's just based around what has come up in the past, okay? Um, and these are the kinds of topics that have come up in the past. You can see the years marked along the top as well. <coughs> Please note that as there is um, a new study design as of this year, you would need to cross-reference this with the new study design because I couldn't make this table fall apart. I couldn't bring myself to do it and just admit this. Um, but some of these things might have been taken out. Now, when I had a look at it, just had a glance and I had read the study design previously, nothing really stood out to me as having been taken out especially because some of the topics they put on there are just broad things that they assume us to have an idea about like tech a topic that mentions technology you don't really necessarily directly study it or study it for long but it's been exam prompts in the past for the essay so you would organize your quote slash example slash evidence to fit for each topic to have like what would you aim for like 10 for each topic but you'd want them to be both covering for and against and you'd have broad quotes you'd also have some linguist quotes about the topic how do you find these examples um maybe you won't be doing this now but this might help you later on you can search with google news and that's how i personally found like pretty much all of my examples just by searching the english language keywords and the past topics that have come up you can change in the search settings to restrict your search to articles only from this year and to australian articles as well and you also should be targeting likely sources for needed examples so just pay attention to what's currently happening and what you think is currently relevant in terms of you know language point of view and you think you will be able to use later on on your in your essay like new slang terms etc so think about what examples you need where you're likely to find them if you're looking for youth speak and those things like slang maybe get them from social media form a language find a speech science jargon might even use one of your textbooks if there's been a curriculum change and you have a recent textbook or go and look for articles and content informal language is probably the easiest in general um, and you speak fits into that but overall for the subject i recommend that you constantly revise meta language uh, make sure you know every one of the words listed by Vika in the study design but not just knowing it but being able to apply it. if you are confronted with a text identify actually find those terms that's going to be harder than just hearing a term and defining you need to be able to find them in text um, and analyze them in their purpose um, you don't need to know definitions you just need to be able to spot features and apply your knowledge exactly right write lots throughout the year do shorter writing activities so it's not exhausting and tiring if you're writing in uh, if you're working with ACs just do an annotation activity one day on another day just write a body paragraph and rather than pushing yourself to do the whole essay but it's not really high standard just try to write your best paragraph okay um, and get lots of feedback and focusing on doing English language styles of analysis sticking to meta language and subsystems 
All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming along. Hope you found this uh, lecture to be very, very helpful. I, I hope that it gives you um, a really good um, head start and consolidation of some things as well. And best of luck with English language for the rest of the year. Thank you, everyone.